We've seen universal circuits already, so you should be ready for this. We saw that we can design a circuit that takes as input a sequence of bits that describes another circuit up to a certain size. Because with the circuit, we have a limited size that we can take as our input, and it can do whatever that circuit would have done on that input for any circuit up to that size. Right? So it's a universal circuit that takes a description of the circuit in. And we saw we could implement a val. A val is also a universal function. It takes a description of a function, in this case, in the NAND circ language, still a finite function, and for any function up to that size, and in this case, that size is just given by the size of the input, it can simulate that function. We've seen universality in finite computation already. What universality means for Turing machines is exactly the same thing. But now it's even more powerful because it's not limited to finite inputs. I should say, the inputs are always finite. I misspoke there. Inputs are always finite. We always need to write down our inputs. Where this is not finite computation is that we can have the same machine that can work on any size input, which was not something we could do with circuits. What a universal Turing machine should do is take as input a description of a machine, and we already invented this function that says, well, either that description is a valid machine, and that's the machine it describes, or it's invalid and we use the reject machine. And it takes an input, and it outputs the result of running the machine that that input describes, that the W input describes on X, for any possible machine. So if we have a universal Turing machine, we can simulate every machine, because we can describe every machine with a, a string of bits. So we could even simplify this, because we said, well, we don't need input anymore separately, because right? we can make the machine write out its own input. So we could think of it just taking one input, which is the description of the machine, and output the result of running that machine. Can we build it? So what do we need to do to simulate a Turing machine? Okay, yeah. OK, good, yeah. So we need a way to take a step. So we have, in our description of the machine, we need to be able to take a step. So that means we've got our transition function. It takes in a state and a tape symbol. And we need to be able to do something that can look up. We're going to have to look up the right rule in our transition function. And then we're going to have to update the state. Very similar to what we did for Val, but now we're doing it for our Turing machine model. So we've got to also update what's on the tape. We're going to have to simulate both the state of mind, which is really just a number. That's just the number of the state in a finite state machine. And we've got to simulate the tape. So we're going to have to write to some location on the tape. Right, so we've got to have memory. We've got to have some way to, based on what's in the table, do different things. Right? We have to have some way to make decisions. We have to be able to, based on, say, if the rule said move left, we have to update the state in one way. If the rule said move right, we've got to update the state in another way. Right? So we have to have some way to make decisions. We've seen we can do if with simple circuits. Definitely anything that we saw we could already do with circuits, we're definitely going to be able to build a Turing machine that can do that. Is this enough? Do we just need to be able to model the memory and be able to make decisions? Most importantly, how is this different from Boolean circuits or our NAND circuit language, NAND circ language? Those are all straight line. We always knew when we ran a val, we had a list of instructions and we went down them. Each instruction was some NAND with two variable inputs and one variable output. What do we need to do? Differently if we're going to simulate a Turing machine? It's definitely not going to work with straight line code. If we had simulated it with straight line code, well, it would not be able to work on any size input. It would run for some fixed number of steps and be done. So we need some way to make it so we can keep going. Right? We need some way to say we're not just going to do straight line operations. We need some way to jump back, some way to keep going. Lots of different ways that we could think about doing that. But once we have those three things, if we can simulate memory, if we can make decisions, well, we need enough to do a lookup table, but we've seen we can do that with a circuit. 
definitely anything that we've already seen that we can do in a circuit to build a universal circuit, we're going to be able to do with a Turing machine. But we also need to be able to simulate memory that's potentially unbounded, unlike the variables in NANCIRC, where it was a fixed size memory. Those are the things that we need. We just need a way to remember. We need a way to make decisions. And we need a way to keep going. These pictures are from my children's book on universal computers. I have books to give away. Once you've got those, you can build a universal machine. And you can compute anything you can imagine. And this is what Turing did. So I've been very informal saying, oh, once we can make decisions, once we have memory, once we can do these things, we can compute anything, we can simulate any Turing machine, that wasn't good enough. Definitely, if you wanted to make a really strong argument about this, you had to show exactly how to build one. And this is what Turing did. Section six of the paper is, I'm going to build a machine with a fancy U that starts with a tape written the description of some other machine. This is what we've been calling W, the description of a machine. And what it does is compute the same sequence as that machine that W described. That's what he does. In the paper, there's the full rules saying, here's how to do it. Rules that you can describe as Turing machine rules. We're not going to go through all of them. You can definitely read them in the paper. These are the weird German letters that make it harder to read than it should be. And has a compact notation for describing the rules, but all the rules are just based on the simple kinds of Turing machine rules that we've used. And once you have a universal machine, then you can simulate any Turing machine. You don't need anything nearly as complicated as the one Turing came up with in the paper. There's actually a two-state, three-symbol Turing machine, which arguably is universal. This seems pretty weird to say that's universal because it looks really simple. And this is something that Stephen Wolfram, I'll refrain from saying anything about Stephen Wolfram. He, he proposed this, but he couldn't prove that it was universal. He had this machine and this model of using it. It's a little different from the way we've described Turing machines, but really essentially the same thing. But left it as an open question with a challenge to see if someone could prove that it was universal. An undergraduate student in England was able to prove this. This is not really a practical universal machine. Well, Turing machines in general are not supposed to be practical. There's a 40-page proof, and if you actually wanted to do a computation like 2 plus 2 with this universal machine, you'd be working on it for, for years. I don't know if you could finish 2 plus 2, but I wouldn't try it. The basic idea and why it's kind of still a little bit fuzzy to say, is this really a universal machine? The input to this is not a description of a Turing machine in rules like the way we've been describing it. The input to this is some very complicated kind of input that you've basically said, you start with something that's understandable that can simulate any Turing machine, and then you have all these translators that translate the input into some other much larger, much stranger, much less understandable form, but each one of those is some simulator that then you argue none of those simulators by themselves is a universal machine, that they all have some limit on what they can do, but what you end up with at the end is a universal machine. So if any one of these simulators that you ran to produce the input to this machine was itself a universal machine, then this would be totally bogus. It would be saying, well, outside of your machine, run a universal machine, produce the output, and then replicate that. By showing that none of these were universal, they could make an argument that this is a universal machine. So these exist. We can build universal machines. There are lots of them, even ones with very few states. Mm -hmm.